All right, folks, we're going to get started. Thanks for joining us for the automated production rounds table. We have no idea where this is going to go, so let's uh, let's have some fun. Um, our goal today is obviously to discuss automated production tools. It's a, uh, I guess it's an ever developing area. You know, I think that there's some, been really good systems out there. There are obviously it's some that are still a little bit of work to do. Um, there's automated audio production, there's editing systems. So we're here to learn about some of them and to discuss and obviously have some questions from all of you. So I do want to introduce our leaders for today. So David Rudolph, would you like to say hello and tell people a little bit about where you're from and what you're all about? Yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, David, I'm founder and CEO of Play on Sports. Uh, we operate uh, a service that is in the high school sports space called the NFHS Network. Uh, and so we partner with the 50 state associations, the 19,500 high schools that make up uh, those associations uh, to broadcast live and on demand high school sports from around the country. Um, and Pixelot is a, a very important vendor for us and we've adopted automated production for probably the last three and a half, four years, something like that. All right, great, excellent. Stu Siegel? Not Hi, Stu Siegel, I'm the uh, founder and CEO of uh, Hockey Tech. Uh, we run a service called Hockey TV, which is the leading hockey streaming service uh, in North America. We stream uh, everything, I would say I like to say elite hockey, kind of below the NHL, starting with the American Hockey League. And um, we too have adopted automated production and are increasing that to significantly. Also partnering with the Pixelot uh, with their systems and uh, been doing that as well for pretty much since they entered North America. Again. Great. Uh, Larry Tuscornia. How are you, Larry? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Uh, Larry Tuscornia. I just spent the past two decades at Major League Soccer and always uh, been interested in checking out the automated production and cameras and how it could supplement or just produce our games. So I look forward to this discussion to learn more about it and uh, see how it's progressing. Yeah, sounds good. And Joel Feld from NLL. Hey, Ken, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me. I'm the executive vice president for uh, broadcasting content for the uh, National Lacrosse League, the uh, Indoor Lacrosse League. The season normally runs from December to uh, May. We're hoping to get back on the floor in 2021. Uh, we stream all of our games, um, our, all of our teams produce their games, and we stream all their games um, through our uh, media rights agreement with uh, Turner Sports' as BR Live as a challenger league. Um, working with very small budgets and a very small staff, automated production is a big part of our um, uh, growing workflow. Sure, sure. So uh, for everybody on the call, oh, sorry, on the call, if you want to ask a question, you can use, either use the chat function or the Q&A function. So just fire those away. I guess it's chat on here from what I can see. Um, maybe we'll even do a poll question at some point if you feel inspired. So David Shapiro, I wanted to kind of start with you to kind of give a overview of Pixelot. Um, feel free to share your screen and give people an update on what's going on from the Pixelot perspective. Great, thanks Ken. And thanks everybody for, for joining here. Hopefully you guys can see my screen now. Uh, Ken asked me to just speak for a couple minutes about uh, automated production and what we're doing in the space. And first I'd say, uh, Pixelot has had a lot of success thanks in large part to the 200 plus partners that we have that are using our technology and NFHS Network, David Rudolph and Hockey Tech, uh, Stu Siegel's organization have been a big part of our growth. So excited to uh, hear their stories and successes and failures that they've had in this space. Uh, but Pixelot has spent the past six years really trying to create a uh, revolution in the sports production space through using AI, and I'd say the past six months or so of uh, the challenging times that COVID has brought, um, it's really increased the importance in my mind for automated production. We've seen a lot more people uh, starting to adopt it and increasing their adoption. Uh, so really what we're trying to do, our vision at, at Pixelot is to democratize sports production, right? Sports production in the past 10 years ago was really only a term that was used in professional sports and major college sports. Uh, so by democratizing sports production, we're trying to bring that capability downstream into smaller colleges, uh, women's athletics, which traditionally hasn't been covered as much as it should in the past, uh, obviously high school sports 
and even down into youth sports. So this just shows you some of the numbers uh, that we've achieved uh, most recently. So we have about 10,000 systems that are on fields uh, at high schools and universities across the United States, about 14,000 in total worldwide. So when a system's on a field, we capture and uh, create content for every single game or scrimmage or practice that takes place there. Uh, today, we're starting a new game every 60 seconds. Uh, if you look at the production that we're doing worldwide, and in 2021, with the number of systems we have, we're expecting that to over double. So we'll have a game every 30 seconds that's starting. And the importance of those numbers in regards to the games we're, that we're producing and number of fields we're on is everything that we do is based off machine learning. So with each game, we're able to improve our algorithms and create an even better production. So by having that many systems and games, our production level is increasing. Uh, we've really tried to expand our product portfolio recently to be able to reach everything from the pros uh, like the AHL that Stu mentioned um, and major collegiate sports down into youth sports. So we have Pixlot Prime, which ESPN has used, NEP uh, at 60 frames per second, um, 1080p, so very high level production. Then our, our most wide ranging um, uh, tool is the Pixlot Show, which is what Hockey Tech and uh, Play On and FHS Network are using. <clears throat> and now we're actually releasing a uh, tool that will be used for youth sports. So a very mobile tool. You can use it with an action camera like a GoPro, be able to take it from field to field and produce content. And then we also have a coaching tool that folks like FC Bayern Munich, um, Real Madrid, uh, FC Barcelona are using as well for their coaching technology. So I mentioned earlier that uh, COVID has had an impact on the sports production space. This is uh, how we've been able to have an impact in this space as everybody's lives have changed uh, and their businesses have changed. So number one is fan safety, that almost every organization that's returned to play, it's been with limited crowds or no crowds. Uh, so by being able to offer a streaming product and watch it at home increases the safety, obviously, for fans. And then also athlete safety. Most teams that are playing, there's limited production crews that are able to be on the sidelines and at the game. So using automated production uh, helps from a safety perspective for the athletes as well. And then a lot of the smaller sports, they're really dependent on concessions, ticket, parking, et cetera, uh, to drive their revenue and local sponsorship. And when you can't have fans in the venue, that directly impacts that rev those, all of those revenue streams in a big way. So by having a streaming product, if they didn't before, we're able to add monetization for them. Uh, and then obviously cost savings, uh, we're about a 10th of the cost usually of traditional production to have automated production. Uh, this shows you really the, the core of our technology and how it's working. So the four camera system that you see on the right side of your screen there, it's focused, each of those cameras are on a quadrant of the field. And then what we're doing is automatically stitching those four cameras together to create a very high level panorama of the field of play. And then what we're doing is using our algorithms to track all the players. Uh, so we're able to identify who's in play, who's out of play, so what you're seeing on your screen is the panorama, and then that pink and red square or rectangle uh, is where we're identifying the action is. So the end user is only actually seeing that. So in a real game on the right side, you see the panorama, and then the red square is what the end user sees, and it transitions to um, what you'd see on your screen here. This was at a WNBA game that we did. This just shows you, uh, again, the picture quality probably is shaky here because it's over Zoom, but this was done for ESPN at the NBA Summer League uh, last year, uh, not this past summer, but the summer before. And everything here is 100% automated. So even the scoreboard is being automated here. We have an OCR camera at the scoreboard that's turning it into data and then creating uh, the graphic that you see in the bottom portion of the screen there. So uh, after really uh, starting to master the production piece, we've looked at other tools that uh, our partners want and will help them. So some of the things that we've rolled out recently is one, a white label OTT. So if an organization doesn't have a place to stream, if they don't want to send it to YouTube, 
or they don't have their own OTT, we have a white label that they can use to put their own colors, logos, monetization within that. Uh, graphics, we've invested a lot in that, like you saw in the bottom third there to be able to tie in sponsors also um, to be able to increase their monetization opportunities. Uh, scoreboard that we talked about, remote commentary, and then automatic highlights. So we actually have a condensed game that we do now where we pull all the important moments. So you can watch a basketball game, for example, in 10 minutes instead of the hour and a half long game. You just see every basket that's scored. We're using AI to determine when a basket scored. And then also personal highlights, which I'll show you a quick example of here. We're using optical recognition to track players by the number on their uniform. And then using that then to create personal highlight clips. So at the end of the game, you would have just number 17 and the baskets that he or she scored during the game in a 30 second or a minute long clip. And again, that's being done automatically through AI. Uh, our most recent addition to our platform, we purchased a company called VidSwap, which is a breakdown and analytics platform. So this is really more on the coaching side uh, than it is on the media side. And so what we do is the film that we capture uh, of a high school or college game automatically goes into VidSwap. We're then tagging every single moment from that game. And so a coach or anybody in the media department can sort, see every assist uh, from the season or from the last three games and then be able to just see that. You can annotate on the screen to be able to show a player if you went around the screen this way, you would have been open. Uh, we're able to create shot percentage charts, heat maps, et cetera, like you see in the top right, and then advanced analytics of about 15 different categories, depending on the sport. We're doing this for basketball, hockey, lacrosse, uh, about 16 different sports that we're offering it. So that, that's a high level overview of what we're doing. The way that uh, some of our partners are monetizing um, what Pixlot is doing is through a subscription service, which is similar to what NFHS Network is doing and hockey tech, uh, pay-per-view, some of our partners are using where they're just charging a per game. In Europe, we have a lot of betting companies that are using our stream to be able to stream within their betting application um, and send out to the sports books. Sponsorship has become a, a very big piece. As I mentioned, we're integrating a lot of different sponsorship aspects into our technology. So that's the high level overview, Ken. Uh, I know you wanna get into some of the questions with the great panel that you have. So I'll turn it back over to you and I'll stay on if there's any questions specifically about Pixlot. Yeah, sure. Well, let me see you know, if anybody has a question for Pixlot, feel free to fire it into the chat and we'll get to that. Um, Stu, do you wanna start with them um, from your perspective um, as far as the how automation is, is making a difference for your, your organization? You're mute. Sorry, I think you muted me, Ken. So All right. might have been. <laughs> I didn't realize. Um, yeah, there are multiple applications we use it for. We uh, stream about thirty thousand, what I'll call elite hockey games, annually. Um, we've done that for uh, quite a few years now. We have a subscription service called Hockey TV, and um, historically, you know, we've done the traditional broadcast. Uh, the leagues that we work with, we partner with leagues to be their broadcast partner, streaming partner. Uh, on hockey TV and uh, historically the leagues and teams were responsible for, uh, you know, having volunteers or paid people to do the broadcast, whether that was just straight one single camera or multiple cameras with announcers. Uh, that was kind of up to them what they wanted to do. We had a minimum standard. Uh, we supply uh, the equipment that they use, the video encoders and all that, that does all the mag magic to come in. We also have our own overlay systems and sponsorship systems that we work on. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a call towards, you know, how can we do this better? A lot of times the person who was on the camera would fall asleep or may even be uh, some kid who sees a pretty girl and gets distracted and <clears throat> go to the bathroom or any, any kind of thing you could think of that humans do happens uh, uh, during a game uh, when you have one person doing it. Right. Uh, and uh, so we started experimenting with Pixlot, I think, pretty early on uh, into their entrance into North America and started installing. Uh, currently, I think we have uh, about 200 installations uh, and it enabled us to not only uh, uh, automate that process on behalf of our broadcast partners and leagues, but it enabled us to also add quite a bit of content. So uh, working with Pixlot, we created what we call a uh, 
the hockey TV community network. So when we put uh, a system into a building, for instance, uh, and we're only looking for, you know, we're only contracted with certain content in that building, certain elite leagues, there's certainly a lot of things going on in that arena other than, um, other than the games that we would traditionally broadcast men's leagues and recreational leagues and little peewees and all that stuff that we never put on. So we created a new hockey TV channel called the community network where we're pretty much become the broadcast partner for the facility as well, besides the league and are now um, uh, streaming pretty much all the hockey content out of there. And in fact, we've gotten more than hockey content. I know uh, we had uh, uh, some lacrosse content in a lot of these uh, facilities as well. Uh, box lacrosse and figure skating and all kinds of things that come out of there. So uh, that gives you kind of a quick overview. Was there anything else you wanted me to touch on, Ken? Well, I mean, what have, so what have been the, uh, I mean, what have you learned so far as far as how it's uh, changed the production? Uh, does it feel, does the show feel different than having a camera guy who gets distracted by <laughs> going to bathroom women? We have found that uh, uh, sometimes the <clears throat> AI uh, doesn't work perfectly to follow the action. And, uh, you know, the first instinct would be follow the puck. But of course, when someone shoots the puck on, you know, hockey and icing where they shoot it all, all the way down the rink, you don't want to follow the puck to, uh, to where that's going. You want to follow the action. So I think in the beginning, we worked closely with Pixel Art to, uh, to kind of uh, make the AI, AI as good as it could be. It never could be perfect. Uh, but we have done surveys with our customers and uh, uh, they found the actual AI is uh, overall on average better than the camera people. Uh, in uh, in watching, it's more consistent and it does follow the action better. It's not as jerky and all that stuff. And the quality of uh, of the uh, pictures is great. The other piece that we've uh, done quite a bit on, where we're not just on the uh, uh, kind of uh, consumer fan side, but we work closely with the leagues to provide them their video that they use for coaching and scouting and all those things. And one of the streams we pull out of the uh, system is not only the what we call the produced AI feed, but we also pull that um, that panoramic feed of the entire ice surface and make that available to our teams. Uh, and they're able to create their own videos, such as isolation videos or things like that. They just want to watch one player, they can create that video of that player. Um, at some point uh, in the future, we hope we can automate that process. And uh, we're looking at other ways to do that, but right now it's not as easily technologically feasible uh, or uh, efficiently, let's right. say. But um, yeah, I mean, we, we're doing it at every level, you know, from that community recreational league, mites, kids, and all the way up every one of the uh, 31 AHL arenas have uh, the system installed in there that we monitor. We can uh, control it remotely. Uh, we can turn it on when we want. We even allow our partners to turn it on when they want to do it for things like practices and so forth within our within our ecosystem we have what we've created hockey tv private broadcasting where uh, teams can uh, can record for instance their scrimmages or their own private things and only make it available to themselves you know privately not broadcast it to the whole hockey right. TV subscriber base that's cool uh, the is everything permanently is everything permanently uh, uh installed at your venues or you have to take it in and out every time? No, uh, in fact, every one of our venues, it's permanent installation, except for one. There's one AHL arena, I believe it's in Cleveland. Yeah, it's Cleveland because where the Cavaliers play, uh, the NBA team, they require the, uh, um, you know what they call the monsters, the Cleveland Ice Monsters or something, to take the uh, system down when they're not playing. <laughs> so they're afraid we might record their NBA games or practices or something, so. We said, why don't we just put a thing over why it? Why don't they use it? They should just use it. <laughs> right. <laughs> that right. as well, but it didn't take quite work on. So David, David Rudolph, let's talk a little bit about on the high school market. Um, you know, what, what, what do you see is what, what makes automated production such a good fit for, for the high schools? I think it's a lot of the, the same trends uh, Stu was talking about. Um, you know, just the first thing to kind of know about the high school market is it's extremely fragmented. I think I mentioned before, you're talking about 20,000 high schools, and then you've got multiple sports facilities in each of those high schools, and then hundreds of games um, in each high school. So, you know, you're talking about millions of games a year. Um, 
And so, you know, early on, our model was we equip schools to do manual production of their own games, a lot like what Stu was talking about. We had a lot of the same things where camera operators, 17 year old kids would get a little distracted uh, and the coverage wouldn't quite be so great. But the main problem was what we found is, you know, I'm going to be generous and say maybe 20 to 30% of high schools could realistically stand up a broadcast program and produce their, you know, varsity games of their big sports. Uh, but, you know, the other 70 to 80% of schools, it was, that was too big of a challenge or, you know, what about all the other sports that weren't being covered or all the JV and freshman games. So it was a market that was looking for some technology and some automation uh, for it. So, you know, that's the, that's the main thing in high school, you know, the key to success is comprehensive coverage. Um, you know, we certainly have games that, that perform better, have higher audience and higher revenue than others. Um, but what the fans looking for is just that particular game. The, the JV uh, volleyball parent is just as passionate about that game as the varsity football parent in the state championship game. Um, so, you know, automation was, was really only the way, the only way that we could tackle the market. And, um, you know, it was expanding pretty significantly before COVID, but, um, you know, that's kind of put it on, on, Afterburner. So, I, you know, in the first year, I think we sold 200 units and the next year it was somewhere around a thousand. I think in the third year it was, David Shapiro, may have to correct me, like 3,000. And this year it's going to be over 10,000 systems. Um, David, you're you know. using the Pixelot system? <clears throat> we are. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, you know, what we had, we, it's been an iterative process for us. You know, the, the first year it was all about, could we sell these to schools? Would they, at the price point, would they be willing to purchase them? Uh, and then year two was about, okay, now that we have them installed, how does it work? Um, and like Stu talked about, um, I don't think Pixlot had ever done American football before we came along. So they had to write the algorithm for that. And I'll remember the first game was going great until the team punted. And I don't <laughs> think the Israelis were familiar with it. <laughs> so camera little, went a little haywire. But the, the great thing about the algorithms is, uh, picks like they continue to tweak them based on feedback that we provide and others provide. And once the algorithm is updated, it's updated for everybody. You know, it's not like you have to train a thousand camera operators or five, you know, in our case, we're approaching 10,000 schools. Um, that software can be deployed across the full universe, you know, as soon as it's available. Right. Well, I got a question here. I'm sorry. I'm going to, the, the for, you know, cause like for soccer, when you're dealing with soccer is, the connectivity at a high school football stadium or high school soccer field, how are you getting the feed out of there? Uh, we, I mean, that, that's, that's kind of one of the primary things we have to work on is make sure we have appropriate internet connectivity. We do wired connection. We don't do anything cellular. Um, you know, sometimes we have to work with the school to get a, a line run to that. Um, with a lot of the, the football stadiums where soccer is played and lacrosse is played, we'll do a point to point system that allow us to bring the, you know, the internet without actually running a physical cable there. Yep. Um, I don't know, that was probably one of the biggest headaches in the early days, but yeah. it, um, I'm, it's, the second you say it's solved means there's another hundred schools where we've got a challenge, but uh, it's getting better each year. Excellent, I'm gonna launch a poll just for fun. I've never done this before, so let's see how this goes. There's two questions there. Sorry, I, I screwed up because I have no idea how to do polls. So the first one is, do you currently use automated production tools? And do you, do you think you use an automated camera? We're focusing on camera systems, I think, for today for the most part. So let's see, let's let those chime in. Okay, so a lot of people think they're, they're gonna be using them. That's for sure, and even more. So Larry, I wanna kind of start with you on the next on the next topic, which is, What's next and what's still needed? Because you know you've 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 played with a couple of systems in the past. You've obviously been watching these for a while. Because when you were at MLS, I mean, obviously budgets are an issue, and every time you can, if, if you can eliminate a couple of camera positions or add in more camera positions, obviously you can yeah. deploy people differently. So, what's your sense on when you look at these systems? And let's focus on the camera systems. What's your sense of where they are now and what's still needed? Is it a matter of just the AI getting better? Well, I, first off, I think it's an amazing solution for for like what David and Stu and these guys have talked about is is you can use these systems on smaller productions 
and get them to your fans to watch these games. I mean, it's an amazing solution. My position where I was at was soccer is a little trickier when it comes to major league soccer, not soccer overall, like honestly for training. And I know Pixel out, we've talked with Pixel lot and Doug and the guys over there for years about they wanted to get into our training centers. And that's a great way for the coaches to use as a, as a resource for, as a tool to shoot their games or shoot their trainings. And then also for smaller productions, and we just produced the US Open Cup, which was, you know, smaller productions, three cameras at different smaller fields all around at Division Three high school or Division Three colleges or high school stadiums. And then there's a lot more youth soccer that's happening. So it's a great solution for that. Honestly, we, in our, in my position, we were going to really start digging into this as we, you know, this year was definitely different than any other year. And honestly, all those events took a back seat and we were just trying to get MLS through the year and we did get MLS through the year. But we, you know, we, we have a new uh, event called MLS is ne MLS next. And I, and we were really like, all right, we need to start digging into the automated production uh, avenue of uh, doing automated productions at all these games and thousands of games around, like these guys are doing for high school sport. Um, I don't know where that's going to end up going and I'm kind of selling David and you guys should be talking to MLS because they're thinking of MLS next is something that you should be called Seth about. But the reality is, is then on my level with MLS as the now premier uh, league in the U S it was a challenge where it's just not there. And the reason is, is because the soccer audience is a sophisticated audience and to do an MLS game, Here's what MLS is always being compared to. It's being compared to Premier League, Champions League, Bundesliga that everyone's watching on a Saturday morning that has 27 cameras, beautiful, looks amazing. And we're always battling that. And where I think Stu was talking about where it's, our, you know, the ca I, I'm not going to totally agree. The camera, op camera operator is still, I think, going to be th better than the algorithms that are going on they're getting better as they're going as i've seen over the years but you still want a camera operator and a director because i'll tell you in my position over the years how many times i've called a network truck and told the director you need to push in you need to pull out you're too tight you're too you know and then you guys already brought this up soccer is where well, you guys talked about a punt or a field goal or or um, icing soccer is also a sport with a lot of goal kicks a lot of punting the ball down the field and that's where things started to get a little tricky. Now, again, you start putting the smaller level events on. That's fantastic because people just want to see those games, the hard, hard, hardcore fans. But then when you get to the MLS level, the expectation is, is almost like a Champions League game, which we're not, it's not there, but we, you know, we couldn't take it back. We've also looked at scenarios where do we supplement, like put it as 18s and high end zones. Uh, and that's something that you know, we were thinking about as well. But then when you start when we kind of dug into the budgets, when you start supplementing your already six, seven cameras that we have, seven, eight cameras, when you start adding more cameras, it turned into more technicians almost. Now you, you, instead of having a camera operator, you needed more EVS, need another video operator, you need another technician on site. And we were getting a little, we were like, wait, we're losing camera operators, but now we need more technicians on the back end. Again, we've looked at it. Me personally, I think, uh, soccer will be using this much more. It's amazing that we haven't yet, but, uh, I, and I asked about David Rudolph about the transmission part is when we did the U S open cup and we were in little, uh, <clears throat> Montclair state or wherever we were, we had to pull up an uplink truck and mux three cameras out of a satellite and bring it down, you know, fiber it back into a home run production that route. This is a solution to fix that, but it's all about the connectivity out. You're on mute there, Ken. The host cannot be muted. Oh, it's good you don't automate your mute button. No, now, I know, right? Talk, yeah. And you talk, that's a whole automatically thing. unmutes. That's a whole thing. That's a Zoom feature. <laughs> that you patent that. So I want to bring in Juan Benassar from uh, Media, Media Pro slash Automatic TV. Um, just because he, uh, we were going to have somebody from Media Pro Canada talking about what's going up in Canada. Um, do you want to discuss, what's your take on soccer? Um, uh, soccer production because uh, the league does La Liga, La Liga use any of your systems at all? Yeah, well, thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. I mean, I think Larry made a, a very, very interesting point. 
One thing is making productions of what we call tactical camera for coaches, analysts, as we do in La Liga, uh, in first and second division, or most of the European uh, professional soccer leagues. We also produce for, for MLS, the MLS is back tournament uh, last July in Orlando, providing these tactical camera feeds uh, directly to to analysts and coaches. But Larry made an extremely good point. When we are talking about broadcasting quality, I think that in short, the objective is to minimize the usage of personal or crew. I mean, uh, most probably what will be needed is mixing automatic and personal operated, and personal operated cameras, remote production, with replace and graphics. Why? Because most probably by centralizing the production, as you said, we can produce at multiple locations on a match day, uh, gaining consistency. So all the, the footage, all the view will be quite similar for the viewer and minimizing the cost for the client. So in this way, we can produce at lower cost to produce smaller leagues, and tournaments uh, through OTT platforms to smaller audiences, not viable uh, actually from a cost perspective if we have to go with big tracks and a lot of technicians. And I would like to add that automat automated production, but with great quality. That means more natural or human productions. Uh, so, and by image quality is a quite open concept or topic. Uh, I mean, all the aspects that are considered in a sport broadcasting production, which are a lot. So I think the key is not only training the artificial intelligence algorithm with more footage and so on, but also incorporating uh, production styles, a sport knowledge. I mean, this has to be, I think, in the DNA of the development team. Right. In our case, uh, our engineers are discussing all day long with uh, sport directors, camera operators. I mean, and we have to, to, to be able to get all this inside the algorithms to make these human productions also automatic. Sure. So David Shapiro, I want to bring you in here too, because I have a couple questions that pop through, um, which I guess gets to, to Juan's point about, um, you know, knowing the sport. So how about sports like baseball or tennis where the action is super quick and the ball flies quickly? Is there a relationship between uh, flight and speed of said ball and ability to track it properly? I guess golf has shown that it's not necessarily a correlation, but. Yeah. So for baseball, we actually do have a solution. Uh, it's a little bit more challenging than the typical <laughs> rectangular field, uh, just because it's based on a diamond. You know, we have our camera system right now that's set up behind home plate and gets the wide angle so you can see, you know, both foul lines and it zooms in depending on where uh, the action of the game is. And then we're actually in the process of doing multi-angle automated switching. So we have a camera behind center field fence, camera behind home plate. As the pitch is coming in, you'd be on that angle coming from behind center field fence. As soon as the ball's hit, you'd go to the more wide angle behind home plate. So we do have that solution. For tennis, we do not currently have an algorithm for it. Um, as you stated, like the back and forth and how fast that ball is going to the opposite sides of the net, uh, you'd get seasick probably watching that. Uh, right. We do have some people that have used a fixed frame for tennis where we just have a fixed frame on the court since it's such a small court, but we're not doing any of the ball or player tracking in tennis. Right, gotcha. And then what about, mo how about motorsports? <laughs> For both of you. Um, uh, so Motorsports Pix Pixlot does not do either. Uh, again, somebody could do a fixed frame to just focus on the track, but we don't have an algorithm for tracking a race right now. Right. Now, would that process start? Let's say someone said that to you, I want to do motorsports with you guys. Would you, and you say, well, we're starting from scratch. So you, you got to get the AI going. So do you just ingest, you just say, give us, you know, 35 races, we'll ingest them and we'll kind of crank some, you know, some intelligence through it and over give us five months we'll figure it out is that how the kind of process works or 
Uh, I mean, if we if business was slow, then maybe. <laughs> but since we're growing so quickly uh, right now and focused on improving the existing sports that we have and you know, changing our product to be more mobile in some instances, uh, it's not a priority for us right now to add some of those more niche sports. Uh, we really want to improve the ones that we have right now and make them that much better. Uh, with that said, I think, you know, new sports that we'll probably add sometime soon would be sports like cricket, where we've had a lot of demand. Uh, you know, we'll probably add one or two a year over the next few years. But if somebody comes to us just with, you know, one project, we aren't going to drop everything and focus on that. Right. So somebody asked, is, is, are, are the cameras connected baseband in the facility or is this IP? And if IP are using RTSP, RTMP, or, sorry, RT, RTSP, RTPM, and or, or, or SRT? Is it an yeah, IP? So using all RTSP and R, R, uh, RTSP is the, the primary one that we're using. Um, and so we have, we have a hard line connection, as David mentioned, uh, on all of our systems. But we have optimized it to be able to operate on low bandwidth. So right now, we only need a minimum of five megabits per second of upload speed in order to get a live stream. And even if connectivity goes out and we don't have anything, we're still going to capture because uh, we have a computer in the venue. So everything's still going to be on that computer. It's just the stream is going to be slightly delayed. Right. Gotcha. So Stu and David Rudolph, I mean, as far as when you look at next generation enhancements, what's on your wish list uh, for improvements, enhancements? If anything. Stu, you can go first if you want. Um, oh, you put me on the spot. <laughs> uh, I mean, the technology works. Uh, very well. Obviously, there's a lot of things that we'd love it to do. Um, for us, we implemented PixLog uh, pretty early on before they had a lot of the features they currently have, uh, and we kind of integrated them into our workflow. Uh, so a lot of the things that they currently offer, we do on our side. Uh, there are some places where those don't, are not all that compatible. And um, we're kind of always working towards trying to figure out the best way to do that. Uh, David's always on the phone with us, uh, with our folks uh, and the folks in Israel. Right. But trying to uh, figure it out. But I'd say that's probably the main thing we have. There's also, you know, as new technology, it does uh, sometimes get a little glitchy. Uh, updates and between operating system updates and fix a lot updates, we occasionally run the normal bugs that you might see in uh, any kind of technology product that needs someone to get on. But, uh, you know, pixelot has been very responsive in uh, working on that. And some, occasionally it's on our side as well. So I don't want to blame <laughs> Pixelot for everything. Right, right, right. David? How, how, real quick, how big oh, is a crew? How big is a crew on a normal hockey game still? Like when you're doing a regular game, one system, how big is the crew? Well, Larry, you talk about uh, you talk about the MLS and probably our closest comparison would be the AHL that we do for the American Hockey League, it's, uh, minor pro league, number two league in North America. Um, they continue to do multi-camera broadcasts and use uh, uh, the automated technology as kind of a secondary stream. We use it on the uh, mobile app as well, where there are a lot of cool features that they can do, and uh, as well as um, you know, to have that uh, panoramic view for coaching and scouting purposes. The AHL is a development league, so the NHL teams like to get that video as well. Uh, and, uh, and the commissioner actually uses it for supplementary discipline because a lot of the dirty work in hockey, yeah. which is probably even dirtier in soccer, <laughs> happens behind yeah. them. And uh, <laughs> uh, so it captures everything. So well, nothing that's what we just put in the MLS put just housed all our facilities with second spectrum cameras so that's what we're using for the competition side of things for a panoramic or yeah yeah so you can capture everything that's happening yeah. well then you know pretty high def so uh, no one gets away with anything um but as far as crews i mean it depends on what they want we we do a lot of we do quite a bit with zero crew um you know if you want uh, announcing you know, you need an announcer, but that can be done remotely as well. Uh, and then we have other situations where we have multi-camera situations where the pixel is part of that, um, you know, the automated technology. But uh, even even uh, 
the system even has an ability to uh, uh, create the illusion of multi-camera by uh, switching. If you want to produce them, which is very rare that we do, you can uh, use the, the pixel out camera to, as is David showed before, there are different zoom windows. You can create multiple zoom windows, not the, the automated one, but you can actually pick a zoom window. So if you wanted to show the coach talking to the players on the bench and cut through, you can do that as well. So it's neat technology. We, we find new things all the time that can be done with it. I'm not sure it really is, uh, <clears throat> or it's not gonna replace your six camera system for yeah. sure. That's not what the intent is. This is uh, really for you, the supplemental in your range on professional or uh, really more geared towards that place where they really can't afford to send camera people in or the, the quality of the camera work is not good enough for justifying it, you know, with a single camera. So uh, given that, the, Stu, do you think that is the, is the goal to, um, if you're gonna replace, if you're gonna supplement so you can move camera people to more creative positions, right? So do you sit there and say, well, let's just do the sim, what, what is the simplest position that you're looking at? Is, is it center ice? Is that, the, is that the easiest well, I, place to be? I, and then you supplement around the sides or you put in the corners and, and add new dimensions? I believe every one of our uh, automated cameras are mounted at center ice in an ideal position. So you get that center ice view of the person looking back and forth, you know, watching the game from center ice. And that's basically the, I guess the key camera in probably every sport uh, that's on a court. You know, is that center ice and a court center field view and someone sitting in those seats, which are usually the prime seats to sit in. Uh, so, uh, yes, you can supplement that with other cameras uh, to cut away if you have a production crew, but that can be kind of your base, your base camera and you can cut away. We don't do a lot of that. We do some of it, but very limited. Most of what we're doing when we have this in is a single camera center ice view. Right. In my view, when we were looking at some cameras, and I, I said it earlier, was the, the high end zone, more of your tactical cameras. Uh, because that in soccer, that game camera is on the air 85% of the game. Mm -hmm. So it's such a vital camera that you want. Honestly, some of our best directors are like, I want my best camera operator on camera one, because that's what everyone's going to see the whole game. So when we looked at stuff, let's put it in a high end zone, let's put it in a slash position, let's put it at the 18s, more replay sources. Um, and that, I think brings up the question of if you are supplementing, is there any latency? I think there was a little bit. Is there latency on the on the system with the cameras going back into a switcher? Because I thought maybe that might have been a, an issue we dealt with it previously. There is. There's a seven second delay yeah. on the pixel outside. Yeah. That's the issue with supplementing it. Yeah. Yeah, now, with, with that said, we have had some people like the Pac-12 that have put it into like a Simply Live, been able to time the other angles up with our delay, and then had one output that's all together seven seconds delay. Yeah. Go ahead, David. I'd say I'll take a slightly contrarian point of view, but then kind of talk about you know what we see as next is you know I think in ten years, the overwhelming majority of all sports content will be produced this way, including up into the college and pros that. I don't know. I've, I've yet to see an industry that when the robots come, uh, the humans end up beating the robots. Um, it's just a, it's computer. And, and again, the current technology is not ready for broadcast HD prime time of all the major sports. But again, I, I would bet you in 10 years, the vast majority will be produced in this way. And I, I think leagues and uh, rights owners are smart to start experimenting with some of these supplemental games or, you know, kind of lower end games to learn it. Um, and again, I think you'll just, you'll see this creep up into college. You'll see this creep up higher and higher into college and into kind of the lower professional and ultimately, you know, into some of the major leagues. I mean, what, what's coming, I'll, I'll talk about two things, one that's more near term and then one that's maybe a little bit longer. And I don't want to give away any trade secrets on stuff we're working on with Pixlot, but I'll hint at a couple of things. Um, the near term is on the audio side and, and Larry talked about that, you know, fans want play by play and color commentary. Uh, they have that option now at the venue, but uh, adding that capacity where you can add multiple audio play-by-play -play to it um, from people who are remotely. And that, that's really important for you can then add both home and away audio. Um, you know, the biggest complaint we get is uh, the announcers were biased. Well, they were calling the home team. So, of course, they were biased. <clears throat> so. Heard that my whole life. Yep. So, we'll be at, that, that's something we'll be rolling out. Um, in the coming year. And then longer term, 
David touched on it uh, in his presentation. Uh, the tracking of individual players is very important. And uh, that is leading to identifying numbers uh, automatically, uh, which is a, a very, very tricky technical thing. Uh, when you're talking about a single camera and lots of action, you know, 22 players on the field at the time in football, same in soccer. Um, as that matures, that is, that is in development now, as that matures, that opens up a whole world of new opportunities. So not just game highlights and summaries that David mentioned, but individual player highlights and summaries. Uh, and then, you know, with some of the things they're doing now with BidSop, where you're adding that, uh, the, the, the metrics to it in real time or in near real time, uh, you know, you'll see in the next five years or so, players will walk off the court or the field and they will get their own personal scorecard for that game that shows them the distance they ran, the shots they took, the highlights they made, you know, all of it kind of clickable where they can see the video. Um, but again, a lot of that comes from we've, we've got a, we, Pixlot has got to solve the, the identifying the player number challenge. Uh, and then a lot of these things are, are going to become very real, very quickly. Um, but that'll be, that'll be a very powerful tool in the youth market where you can get that instant feedback the second you walk off the court in terms of how you performed. Great. Excellent. So Joel, you've been very patient. I have one more question before I get to you, Joel. There's just one more that, that popped up. 8K ROI. So I saw this at the Super Bowl. There was an 8K camera that Sony tried it out. Gorgeous. You know, covered the whole field just about. Um, and you would extract. So what's your sense, David and, and, and Juan, as far as um, 8K cameras, you know, do, do the, do the, is there a room for that kind of a, a deployment of a single 8K camera and kind of just doing the whole thing with one from one spot? Is 4K good enough? So, I mean, we have four different 4K cameras in the head. Um, I do think that 8K future, there's potential for us to utilize it. And we've done some testing but haven't productized anything with 8K yet. Gotcha. Juwan, from Media Pro perspective, 8K. It's a good topic. Uh, we, we are a little bit on the same. I mean, we have been testing 8K <coughs> cameras. They are possible, but they are not practical today. Yeah. Glass is a little expensive in the camera. <laughs> All right, Joel. No, yeah. not, all, not only the cameras, but all the processing that is needed. Right, I mean, right. the, the computer and so on. That's true. That is true. That's a, lot of, a lot of data. So, Joel, I would like to introduce you to discuss. Uh, you had an announcement today with, with Grabio and Greenfly. So, do you want to tell us what you were doing? You just shift a little bit towards automated highlights creation. Yeah, happy to. For, first, before I do that, I just want to say that I found the first part of this presentation or the roundtable so compelling that um, particularly the pixel art pieces that um, um, you guys are making me rip up my entire production plan and give you guys a call. So um, thank you for that. I, I couldn't agree with you more, David. I think you said, you know, what, what the future looks like in the automated broadcast live production space, you know, both with, you know, COVID um, accelerating certain um, reasons for people to take uh, bigger risks and having to look at different ways of doing live broadcast production and quite frankly, just where the business is going. So I couldn't agree with you guys more. Um, and I'm really glad that I was able to participate in that part of the panel so I could hear what y'all are up to. So um, really well done. I think you guys are really on the right track. So um, congratulations to that. Um, I guess I was asked to come in on the user, on the, on the content side. Um, um, before I talk about our partners, I just want to say that, you know, as a challenger league, our tech stack is, obviously really important to deliver um, real time and near time content to our fans. We're using tools like Grabio and Greenfly. Uh, we've actually been in business with both for a little while now. Um, so we've had some really great experiences with both of those companies. Greenfly on the um, live highlights, uh, on the real time highlights uh, turnaround, uh, ingest and cutting and highlights and turnaround and Greenfly on the user generated, user -generated uh, content side. <clears throat> Um, as far as Greenfly is concerned, um, you know, with our, in conjunction with our marketing department, we've really grown the, the use of our partnership with Greenfly over the last um, few months, particularly 
um, uh, as it related to our um, social content and our primary communication tool that we used as uh, part of the, our 2020 entry draft, which was back in, in September. Um, a marketing team supported on the lead up to the draft uh, by requesting photos and videos from all of the incoming draftees on the Greenfly platform. Um, it's the first time that the league had onboarded future players to Greenfly before they were added to the active team rosters. Um, and that process really had no friction and a lot of enthusiasm on the, uh, on the player side. Um, the team shared the media on, on all of our um, uh, league social channels. We provided it back to the athletes for their own social um, sharing. And during the draft, the league solicited NLL player and, um, uh, and drafty reaction shots and videos and behind the scenes moments and other um, unique content as well. Sorry, I think that's my phone. That's yeah, as long as it's yours, you're the only one who can have it. <laughs> Wait, hang on one second. Let me, uh, let me hang up on this person. You're persistent. Sorry about that. Never would have envisioned that happening a year ago, by the way. I just want to let you know. That, would have never, that was never part of my life. Five minutes in the middle of the rings. Um, we always use a live clipping and editing platform, uh, Grabio. Um, as I mentioned, seamlessly integrating Greenfly and Connect. Uh, send personalized galleries of drafty selection moment videos and clips for them. Um, so it really was a great collaboration. And, um, you know, when a big part of our effort is to um, embolden our players and get them more involved in our content and produce more user generated content and get them in front of fans. Greenfly has really proven to be a, a really great platform for us to uh, go down that road. Great, excellent. So Dan, you wanna say something about, tell us a little more about Green, Greenfly? Yeah, I mean, thank you for the, the kind world, words, Joel. And it's just been a, you know, a, a, a fantastic partnership. I, I think it's really, interesting you guys have been really innovative in, in really piecing those two part, parts together like the the highlight clip uh, production and and then the distribution you know out to the athletes and stuff like that uh, i think in thinking about automated video production i mean i think we think about uh, greenfly kind of relates in two different ways so one is to start to broaden the view beyond just um these incredible tools like pixelot for uh capturing and filming content during events but, you know, what are tools for capturing and getting content outside of events from capturing, getting athletes, you know, from their workout routines, from their, um, you know, at home routines, from their, you know, behind the scenes and stuff like that. And just as there are limitations, um, you know, for, for certain sports and events around uh, you know, production budgets can be allocated, you know, uh, there are similar limitations when it comes to that kind of behind the scenes and supplementary content. You're not going to send out camera crews to people's homes and to film these things to do these incredible kind of background um, uh, stories. And so you need a, a way to get content from people. And at the same time, the kinds of behind the scenes content that people are, are interested in now has gotten much more informal. You know, it's gotten much more direct and, and there's a lot more, not just, I wouldn't say just tolerance for lower production values, but even a, an embrace of it and a sense of authenticity being related to it. And then on the flip side, you know, is, is what Joel was talking about, which is really, you know, when you look at these automated production tools, they also have tremendous advantages. And we've heard a lot of different things about that today in terms of generating a lot more content, individualized content, really slicing and dicing things up into uh, much more specific ways. And the question is, you know, what do you do with that content and how do you use that, th those abilities to really engage a much broader audience? And the answer is, not just to put that content out on your own channels or even your, your broadcast channels, but to use supplementary social channels to really, um, you know, to really drive attention back to broadcasts and back to things that are monetizing, but, but to really engage people where they are. And so when you think about sports, you have the world's greatest built-in advocacy network. You have the athletes themselves who can connect uh, and, um, and, and really uh, you know, connect much more intimately and directly with fans and also do it in interesting segmented ways. You have international athletes that might connect with different regions and fans of different areas or different age groups or all sorts of things. And so, you know, really, uh, you know, I think there's, there are opportunities around both getting content outside of the field uh, using uh, a, a tool like ours and also using a tool like ours to really maximize the value and impact of the content you're able to create. 
you know, on the field and, and with, you know, tools like Gravio, tools like Fixlot and things like that as well. Yeah, I was talking with um, WSC Sports a couple times this year. I mean, it's, it really is, and Larry, I know you can probably vouch for this too. You know, the goal is to use these tools and Stu, obviously, and David Rudolph. You know, the goal is to make your organization appear bigger than life, right? So, you know, when you have a social media team of like two people, it's really hard to kind of pump out content for all the different various social media channels. So, you know, so Larry, from, you know, from, from your perspective, you know, how do you see these tools, leaving aside the live production side, that, that challenge of, of just camera work, if you will, quality camera work. But what do you see as the role of automated production for, for allowing for more pub- publishing to teams and to players and to, you know, sponsors? And well, stuff? that's what we did. We, we, we have a partnership or MLS has a partnership with WSC. We were sending them the feeds and they were you know, automating two minute, four minute, 15 minute cut downs of games, sponsors, um, but what we did learn, honestly, and it's gotten better over the years, but as automated as it was, we always had to go back and tweak with them and work with them, right. make sure <clears throat> the algorithms were taking exactly what you needed because there's nothing, it's easy to say goals, but goals aren't the whole story of any game or touchdowns or home runs right. are not the whole story. There's a questionable call, questionable play, questionable or a great defensive play that started a counter that changed the whole game and that's where it got a little tricky but but what we saw over the years is it did get better it did get better but you still again what i think we you know still at the beginning of this whole world of automated production is still got to babysit a little bit you still have to have someone managing it thinking about it looking at it um so you're not just automatically publishing a two-minute highlight package because as you guys you know, the last thing you want is a two minute highlight package that is on YouTube and on the website and on your sponsors. And the fans are going to watch that and say it totally missed the biggest play of the game. So right. those are just some of the things. But again, it's improved over the years. But that's just something I think everyone needs to still be thinking about. You still have to babysit all of it. Now, that said, you don't need 10 games, 10 editors. You just have one or two people managing that whole process. Right. right. And that just keeps getting better and better, though, as, as the years progress and it keeps learning and learning. And I think it's just, again, I think overall with live production or, or in these uh, automated highlight packages is it's just going to be more prevalent over the years. It's going to be more and more. So, so let's, let's have fun debating the heart and soul of, of artistic artistry of, of, you know, what being a great camera person. And, you know, you do see more of the, you know, the full frame cameras being rolled out to kind of capture more emotional shots. So What's the long-term play here? I mean, do you think, does emotion become less important and we just focus purely on the, just telling the story um, or does this allow camera people to say, you know what, you don't have to worry about telling the story from a, from a purely tactical standpoint, but rather find the emotion, right? So your job is not to just cover the play, but to find that really great extra look going in deep, super close replay. Any thoughts on that whole this sort of challenge of the? I think I think what you see just just go to the NFL. Like the NFL is a big time production, but when you're watching a Joe Buck game, there's there's 22 cameras on a Joe Buck game. But when you're watching, just you know, the Jets game now versus Carolina, it's the fifth or sixth, and there's only five or six, seven cameras on that. So there's going to be levels on everything you do. When you watch a World Cup, there's 38 cameras and there's six cameras just facing the fans to get that emotion when a goal happens and you get the emotion with super slow mos of fans. So right. It comes down to the budget and how many people, what budget you have. So what revenue you're cut bringing in and what you could spend on those bigger productions. I think what we've all mentioned here on high school and lower level sports, this is a fantastic tool to create that avenue for your fans to watch the game. But as the events get bigger and bigger and the budgets get bigger, that's where you're going to see more emotion. I think this is a great avenue to make it available to anyone to watch. Right, right. Anybody else thoughts on the whole artistic angle and how that, you know, is, is this a threat to the future of, of that sort of side of the business? Well, in the end, it's all about money. These are primarily businesses. <clears throat> um, you know, Larry, when you're producing, uh, Pro sports, I mean, that is the product, right? When we're uh, delivering um, an amateur hockey game, we're not really the product. We're just part of the part of the experience and bringing that product uh, to people who can't. 
And, and now in COVID times, you know, people who can't be there now in COVID times, that number's increased significantly. People can't get into the arenas. And, um, you know, the vast majority of our viewers and a lot of the leagues we cover, the fans are friends and family of, you know, of the players, of the team. Um, I mean, we do do quite a few what I'll call fan-based leagues that have other than that. But, uh, you know, it's the opportunity now, especially during COVID times, to be able to get in there, not only to be able to see uh, people play, the fans, but, um, you know, as we talked earlier, the actual crews, keeping them safe as well. So, yes, I think there's a big difference between, you know, the product and what you want to deliver. You know, this is about, as uh, I think David said, the democratiz democratization of sports. Is that what you called it, David? Hmm. Um, for Pixelot's uh, slogan. So, you know, bringing that uh, capability uh, and broadcasting capability to the lower ends of sports, not, not really the high end. Right, right. Well, to me, the, the fascinating thing is, you know, if you go back 10 to 15 years, you know, there were some, you can get away with, a, with I think the, the um, sophistication of the viewer now, they're much more demanding. I mean, Larry knows this probably as well as anybody. There's no such thing as, well, it's just MLS, so you know what, you can kind of, I mean, you get compared to, you know, the big time leagues. So that's sort of the beauty of these tools. You can, you can start to compete, you know, and, you know, for Joel and his team, you know, you can kind of say, okay, we're going to have a story that's as big as, as, you know, the, the bigger lacrosse leagues. I remember talking to the cricket, the Caribbean and cricket league, they're able to use it and kind of create a lot more content than they could have ever done before. So I think it's really fascinating to see how, and that gets, it gets you started on that journey, right? Cause then you can create more revenue, create more value for your rights, uh, find dark markets, right? Which otherwise you, I mean, Joel, you probably couldn't create NLL highlights for China, but maybe you could now cause it's automated, you know, like that kind of stuff is, is really cool. So we just couldn't produce the volume of highlights and serve our audience without being able to use um, an automated tool like Rabio. Just, we just simply couldn't afford to do that. It just would be too dinosaur-like in our approach. And so those tools, you know, allow us to be able to serve, to your point, serve an audience at a much higher level with a greater sense of demand and plus also deliver across various social media platforms simultaneously so that there's a lot less back-end labor involved. It's really just click these boxes, touch your highlights, click these boxes, and your clips are going to go out with a little piece of commentary to all of the various social media platforms that the league is focused on virtually simultaneously. So we just couldn't compete if without a tool like Gravio, quite frankly. We would, you know, have a couple of guys in the basement someplace cutting some highlights and they'd go out like, you know, eight hours later. And that's just not what our audience wants. Right, right. One thing I also heard was the, um, with the pandemic, pandemic was also without the fans in the stands. So Lavo introduced a product called Kick. That was, uh, Larry, did you ever see the Kick system? The Kick, uh, the mic tracking system. <clears throat> so for soccer, so when, and, you know, that little demo at like NAB or IBC where they had a little soccer field. And then as the ball went around the field, the little fake ball, um, the cameras, the, the mics would track to follow the, the but with, without fans in the stands. So with fans in the stands, they were, people were like, well, there's no reason for this because you can't really, it doesn't add that much. But they're saying without the fans, all of a sudden the Lavo kick system is shining and sparkling because you can really hear the the enhanced audio of the of the of the kicks and the, you know the, the players and the cursing and the, we had to deal with the cursing and yes exactly. deal, that's where the seven second delay comes in and there you go mute out the cursing right exactly so anybody else as far as questions from the audience anybody else comments thoughts concerns i'll make one observation just based on the the kind of the automated and manual i, I think a lot of folks look at it as you know oh the the robots are going to come and replace humans or I, I view it as more of an and that I think it's the automated stuff is is going to take the place of things that it's easy for the computers to replace and it'll free up the humans to do the stuff that's hard or impossible. Um, so, I mean, I, I look at it as, you know, the sports reporting that, you know, you used to have reporters writing game summaries, which is a waste of time when you have a computer who can crank out a game summary just as quick and that frees up the humans to write the analysis. So. You know, I think on the higher end sports where you can afford to have manual uh, camera operators there, uh, it frees them up to focus more on the emotion and give that higher end production of what it's like to be there uh, instead of having to dedicate, you know, five, six, seven people just to doing the, the game coverage. So I, I actually think, you know, the blending of automated with manual on the high end stuff is actually going to open up more creative angles um, 
in not it, it's not going to be a job eliminator. I, I think it's going to it's going to allow the the people who are really good at it to do an even better job. Yeah, sure. I, think, I, I think David's exactly right there. It really widens the pool because now instead of just having a small percentage of games produced, you're going to have millions of games produced, and so there's a lot of different jobs and opportunities around those. And I think outside of the media portion also, you look at coaching, right? Every single basketball, football, soccer, baseball programs, they're videoing every practice, every game to break that down with their players. Well, now if you can take those two or three people off of the camera and have them actually look at the footage and help the coaches think about how to utilize that video, uh, then you're going to be more productive and also safer, right? You don't have somebody on the big lift, like remember Notre Dame and the Cowboys, somebody mm -hmm. died being on the big lift. Now you don't need those people up there. Right. Well, I think David, I mean, you have a big client uh, that I spoke to um, actually, you know, so, uh, so does automatic TV, actually same client, I believe, but they are making the point that without these tools, because some people say, well, this isn't right. You're replacing people. This isn't, you know, you're, you're killing the industry, but he made the point, look, without these tools, those games aren't being done. So you're, you were not replacing people because those games would simply not be produced at all. That's exactly I think that's, right. You know, so it's going to be, I think there's obviously going to be at some point, I think the ten, some more tension, you know, especially if you try the directing thing. I know we've looked at some of the soccer, EVS has shown some demos of soccer directing, you know, and that kind of, you know, when they sit there and say, well, which one's directed by the person, which one's directed by the machine, you kind of go, I can't really tell. And that's kind of unsettling, I think for all of us, but you know, yeah, but they're showing you a 10 second snippet. Right. Yeah. Right. Not telling you over the course of an entire game. Yeah. It, it all comes down to the dead ball. When there's right. a dead ball, where is it going? But I know that's constantly being worked on. Right. Now I'm going to, I'm going to mention one uh, I, I, and I can't remember whose system was used. So I'm going to, I'm not going to blame anybody or, or, or throw anybody on, under the bus or on top of the tram or whatever. But there was that game, there was a soccer game where the, where I was tracking the referee's head the bald head. So I say this on behalf of all bald people. Um, so in that kind of a situation where the automated system takes over and says, okay, the, the referee's head, that is the ball and starts tracking. How do you break out of that system? What is the solution, you know, for both for, for um, David Shapiro, as far as in those, how do you kind of manually override in a situ system, situation like that? Yeah, so it depends if you've got somebody like on site there that could manually override it. Um, and go into what we call manual production mode, where we actually have a joystick that you can take over the production with. Um, but I'd say the beauty behind that kind of instance is, you know, yes, you have one bad game, but then as David Rudolph talked about earlier, you can adjust the algorithm uh, later on, you know, right. next day, even as quickly as that, and then apply that fix to the 14,000 systems that we have across the world so that that doesn't happen ever again. But, you know, I think that's part of being in this space with new technology, you are going to have some challenges and bumps in the road, as long as you've got the processes and the people in place to be able to fix those things. So it doesn't continue to happen. You don't have the same problem twice. Right, right. So somebody asked, will the automated directors be able to show their automated friends and family in the stands? So, <laughs> any thoughts on that? I like that one. Yeah. Assuming there are fans in the stands. Right, yeah. <laughs> that's true. Let's get to that, that point first. So I guess this is also a primary model of asset management in the Pixlot slash automated production universe. So for both uh, Juan and and uh, and uh, David, what is the audit? What is the asset management uh, philosophy as far as storage? Um, how are you guys storing content just on big massive servers? So, so we actually use AWS, uh, so everything that we store is through them. And then in terms of how long we store stuff, it really depends on our agreement with each partner. You know, we have packages down from, if it's, for example, a youth sports facility, a lot of times they only need storage for a couple of weeks, whereas colleges want storage for 12 months and pro teams want storage for at least 12 months. So it depends what our partner wants, how long we store. Right. And from the automatic TV perspective? Uh, that's complex. I mean, sometimes it's local because right. depending on the clubs, teams, competitions, they don't want uh, their content to be spread. And uh, so this is local on the servers. And sometimes, uh, like in the Pixelot case, uh, this is on AWS. So it's a mix. Right. So it's very flexible. 
Great. Well, excellent. Well, thanks so much, guys. I think we're going to wrap up right here. This has been great. Really appreciate your time. It went, flew by very quickly for an hour and 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> it's good. To, you know, hopefully you all join us tomorrow for our sessions that start at 1130. We're going to have uh, tomorrow is PGA. I'm doing a golf thing with PGA, USGA, and uh, CBS Sports. That'd be a good one. League panel discussion at 1215 to one o'clock with Jason. And then we're going to close out with auto racing with NHRA, NASCAR, and IndyCar. So, and we have two more, more roundtables tomorrow. Also, the future of live production, which has about 600 people coming into it. So, be sure to sign up for that too. So, thanks so much, everybody, for joining us. Um, this is great. Thanks, so, man. and uh, thanks again to Pixel, Pixel Lot for the support and everybody else for your participation. And we will see you all tomorrow. Thanks, thanks so much, Kenny. Great thanks, job. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thanks. Bye, Bye everyone.